Welcome everyone. My name is David Wood and I chair London Futurists. Our speaker today, Simon Anholt, has over the last 20 years or so, as the presidents, prime ministers and governments of more than 50 countries with the goal of helping them to engage with the international community more imaginatively and more effectively. These governments engage with Simon because he is recognized as the world's leading authority on national image, or to use a term Simon says he no longer likes, nation branding. Because this concept has, he says, absolutely nothing to do with marketing, PR, or communications. It's all about countries earning a better reputation by contributing more to the world. And on that point, Simon publishes the Good Country Index, an annual survey that ranks countries on their contribution to humanity and the planet. As some of you may know, Simon's TED Talk launching the Good Country Index has been viewed over 10 million times and his nine TEDx talks over a million times between them. More recently, Simon has published a book that I found to be deeply engaging and inspiring. The Good Country Equation, how can we repair the world in one generation? Simon, welcome to London Futurists. How can we repair the world in just one generation? Over to you. Thank you, David, and, and welcome to everybody. Thank you very much for showing up. Um, what I'd like to try and do is to see if I can uh, prove that there are really only two things wrong with the world at this point in history. Um, and to suggest perhaps some directions for fixing those two things. It starts, as David rightly says, when I became interested uh, more than 20 years ago now in the images of countries. Um, I don't know quite why I became interested in that, but it did just seem to me that in a heavily globalized world, we'd all of us fallen into the habit of viewing countries on the basis of a handful of cliches and stereotypes. And that those cliches and stereotypes were incredibly important because they affected our behaviors towards those countries. So at a very obvious level, deciding where you go on holiday is based on your cliches or suppositions or prejudices about the kind of country you're going to. But the same applies if you're a major corporation deciding whether to invest in that country. Sure, you look at a lot of data, but your heart also plays a role and your prejudices therefore engage your heart positively or negatively. And in one way or another, it seemed to me, the destinies of nations, it wasn't too much of an exaggeration to state, were swayed by popular opinions, popular prejudices for or against those nations. And the countries with powerful and positive images find that almost everything they want to do on the international stage is relatively easy and relatively cheap. And the countries that were unlucky enough to have a bad, a negative or a, or a weak reputation found that everything was expensive and everything was difficult. And in fact, the more you think about it, the more significant this factor becomes. It's responsible probably for increasing inequality at the planetary level, because poor countries not only have to struggle against weak institutions and, and weak economies, they also have to battle against the headwind of a negative reputation that turns everything good they do into something bad. And no matter how hard they try, to make people realize that their intentions are positive, it will always be ignored if they have a weak reputation or transmuted in people's minds to whatever impure motivation people suspect that they're, uh, that, that's driving them. So I suppose it began to occur to me in the uh, late 1990s that the images of countries was a very serious topic with very serious political, social, and economic impacts. And it was about time to start taking it seriously. So, as a kind of opening salvo, I wrote a paper um, in an academic journal back in about 1998, which argued these points and said, sort of in conclusion, that in the highly globalized world in which we were now living, governments have to be brand managers almost as much as their policy makers, by which I merely meant that they had to be acutely aware that their country's, one of their country's most valuable assets was in fact its good name and that their responsibility as good leaders was to inherit that reputation from their predecessors and to hand it down to their successors in office in at least as good condition as they found it. Because that is the country's calling card to happy and successful engagements with the international community. 
And without it, as I said, everything is difficult and everything is expensive. What I didn't mean was that you could do branding. I compared the images of countries to the brand images of corporations, but didn't really venture an opinion about whether it was possible to do anything about it. At this point, I was really only interested in noting the phenomenon. But very, very quickly, it was interesting, the discussion really caught on and it went a little bit viral. And suddenly this phrase nation brand, which I'd accidentally coined, turned into nation branding. And the addition of those three letters made a huge difference because it seemed to imply to impatient governments and what other kind of government is there, that if you didn't like the image that your country was saddled with, if you felt it was unfair or out of date or ran against your national interests or your political interests, then there was a way of fixing it, manipulating the way that people regarded your country using the mysterious techniques of marketing and communications, because nobody really knows what the word brand means. It's a very vague, slippery kind of term. And branding sounds like magic. And suddenly, before I knew where I was, I was hearing reports of desperately poor countries in sub-Saharan Africa, very often spending millions and millions of dollars of, of taxpayers or donors' money on the, on the false mistaken apprehension that if they just could raise a Nike sized marketing budget, they could have a Nike sized brand image in who knows a matter of months, and that all of their problems would then go away because they would be admired. Of course, the reality is that you can't shortcut yourself into a good reputation. The reputations of countries really do have to be earned, they can't simply be constructed. Propaganda, which is what we're talking about here, is something that really only works domestically. If you control all the channels of communication reaching your, your audience, your, your citizens, as Kim Jong-un does in North Korea, then you can persuade them of your version of the truth, because if they never hear any other version over time, the version that you hear and your parents and your grandparents heard becomes the version that you believe in. But there's absolutely no evidence I can ever see that this has ever worked outside a country's borders. Yes, to some degree within uh, colonial empires, if you control quite a lot of, the, uh, of the, the messaging that goes to your subjects overseas, you can do a bit of propaganda, but it's always highly imperfect. And the evidence is today in the largely post-imperial world that the harder you try to push a particular version of what you believe your country is good at, the stronger the backlash is likely to be from other voices and you'll quickly be drowned out. So that doesn't work, but what does work? the value of a positive reputation is so abundantly clear and so necessary for countries in order to get all that trade and tourism and attract the talent and the uh, and the, the plaudits that countries so desperately need if you can't get it by messaging your way into it how can you get it well i decided that this was a matter that could be researched and luckily since about uh, 2005 i've been researching uh, popular perceptions of countries i'd created a study called the Nation Brands Index back in 2005, that every year or initially every quarter, it measured the images of a certain number of countries. Originally it was just 11, but it's now 50, uh, according to the perceptions of a sample representing about 70% of the world's population. It's about 38,000 people in 20 different countries. And I decided that it would be a good idea to try to analyze the database that I'd accumulated from this research over the years and to see whether it could tell me really quite a simple thing. Why is it that people admire country A more than they admire country B? Because they certainly do. Well, almost the first thing that I discovered when I launched the Nation Brands Index was that uh, country images are remarkably stable. They really, really don't change very much from year to year. In fact, I quickly realized that the Nation Brands Index was the most boring social survey ever created simply because uh, the images of countries are just sort of rusted into place. If they change at all, they change over decades and generations. I mean, we know for sure that uh, Japan and Germany were virtual pariahs back in the 1940s and 1950s. And today they are amongst, amongst the most admired countries on earth. Germany is regularly the most admired country on earth. So that's a big change, but that's over a couple of generations. And maybe that's the natural timescale. So if we fast forward to 2012, at this point, I realized that I'd accumulated over a billion data points in the Nation Brands Index. So having this big data set was a wonderful opportunity to try and answer that simple question. Why do people admire one country more than another? And so 
I proceeded to do um, a rather ham-fisted analysis of this big database. It's ham-fisted because I'm no kind of statistician, but I did my best. And I got a lot of um, friends who are academics and statisticians of various kinds to help me. And what we ended up discovering is that there are about five main reasons why people admire certain countries more than others. And most of them were the things that you might have predicted. There are things like, is it beautiful? Um, has it got a lot of culture? Is it a powerful country that can impose its will on others? Is it rich? Is it successful? And so forth. But the surprise was that by a very, very wide margin, really quite a significant margin, the most powerful determinant, the most powerful driver of a positive country image and all the virtues that that brings was the perception that the country does good outside its own borders. In other words, that it's a country that is a principled and effective player in the international community. A country, in other words, about which you simply feel glad that it exists, even if you don't live there. So oddly enough, it's nothing really much to do with the success of a country, it's to do with its contribution. So this may seem counterintuitive, especially if you're a little bit cynical about human nature. But actually, if you think about it, you realize that in some senses it's quite logical. Most of us don't very much like thinking about other countries. That's what the research shows. We don't, most of us, spend an awful lot of time doing that. In fact, most of us only ever think about three countries. We think about our own country a little bit, unless it's especially contested. We think about one major power, which is usually the United States, because it has the power to impact our lives. It has an influence over our universe. And a third country, which is entirely personal, it's just the country that you happen to think about a lot because you've got some special feeling about it. It's where you'd like to retire. It's where your daughter is studying or it's a country that you're fascinated in. That's it, three countries. The last time I checked, there were 195 countries. So 192 to all intents and purposes to the vast majority of the world's population simply don't exist. Now against that background, it's relatively easy to see why we would be looking for excuses not to think about other countries. And a country that's good, in inverted commas, one that we perceive contributes to the world outside its own borders, is a country we can successfully ignore. We can safely ignore. We don't go to bed at night worrying about what that country is going to do in the middle of the night because we think it's basically well-intentioned and trustworthy and predictable. And so we like it. And as a result of liking it, we then reward it with our business. We buy its products, we hire its people, we go there on holiday, we invest in its economy and all the rest of it. A country, on the other hand, that's perceived to be a danger to international peace and security or stability or the environment is one we do worry about. And we don't like worrying about countries. And so we penalize it subconsciously, but we do penalize it. We don't go there on holiday without thinking very hard about it. We don't invest in its companies because we don't trust them. We don't buy its products because we don't trust them. And so you can see how these very superficial, apparently quite superficial prejudices and cliches and stereotypes about other countries actually control the flows of trillions and trillions of dollars over the decades. And they control really the way that the international environment functions or fails to function. Now, the discovery that what drives those cliches and stereotypes, what drives our perception of other countries is actually somehow a perception that the country does good to the international community. That's really interesting and really powerful. And if it seems a little familiar, that's because it is. It's actually precisely the same principle as corporate social responsibility, which uh, businesses discovered 20 or 30 years ago, when they realized that if companies want the loyalty of their customers, they've got to do much more than just sell good products at a sensible price. They've also got to demonstrate that they are principled players in the marketplace, that they deserve the place that they occupy as a privileged vendor of expensive products or cheap products, that they give something back to the communities that they operate in. And I think what this data is saying is that corporate social responsibility, or at least the same underlying principles, operate equally at the level of the nation state. So the same people in Canada who might decide not to buy a particular pair of running shoes because they don't approve of the way that the company manufacturing those shoes treats its workers in sweatshops in Bangladesh, might equally decide that they don't want to go on holiday in a particular country because they don't like that country's government's stance on human rights. It's the same people operating the same basic moral and ethical principles in their interactions with countries as they do with companies. And I suppose what that did in a certain sense was vindicate my, vindicate my statement many years previously 
that the people who run countries need to be in some sense as brand managers as much as their policy makers in the sense that they have a responsibility towards their people but also to the whole planet so where do we go from there well naturally my curiosity at this point was this is all about perceptions this is about the countries that people perceive to contribute most to the world that they live in which is a wonderful thing to discover but what if they're wrong where do they get those perceptions from what makes people think for example that norway is such a righteous country such a good positive contributor to the international community and that say russia is less so where do we get that information from because that's almost incalculable countries aren't individuals countries are big complicated structures they can behave in many conflicting ways all at once i remember the very week when i first thought about this stuff um, here in the uk our then prime minister david cameron told us on monday that we should uh, despise and mistrust china because it was a serial abuser of human rights and on friday he told us we should be grateful to china because it was saving our nuclear industry and i found myself thinking at the time well this is supposed to be my subject and i'm confused we must all be very confused but i found myself thinking somehow or other people form these impressions about which countries are broadly good and which countries are broadly not so good somehow or other they're performing that calculation in their minds they are doing that sort of real-time balance sheet for every country on earth could it be possible to actually measure that and help people make that decision on the basis of data an informed decision so that was where the good country index came from and the good country index was an attempt literally to measure a balance sheet for each country on earth to measure how much it contributes to the world outside its own borders and this is entirely different from any other country ranking that there's been before or since because as we know there are hundreds and hundreds of country rankings but they all have this one thing in common that they look inwardly to the domestic performance of countries in other words treating countries as if they were little islands inhabiting their own private ocean completely unconnected to the rest of the world which is of course not the case this is one system and it's uh, extraordinarily interconnected interdependent and interlinked and i felt it was time that we had a study that recognized and paid due homage to that fact because it's the most important fact about life on earth at this point in our history and so the good country index does simply that it's a composite index which takes 35 pretty robust data sets the majority of them from the un system because the un is the only organization really that's got the capacity and the uh, and the and the need to measure what countries do in reality every year with a certain degree of accuracy using normally the national statistical offices of each country to provide the data in each case so it's pretty unbiased as well yes okay we could have a long discussion about the uh, intrinsic uh, structural biases behind the united nations and its history but let's not go there just for now suffice to say that this is the best data currently available at this scale and it's in some ways good enough and what it shows us is indeed um, quite a lot of interesting stuff about which countries do do a better job of harmonizing their domestic and their international responsibilities. If you measure it up against something like the Human Development Report, for example, which tells you how well countries treat their own citizens, you measure that against the Good Country Index, and that gives you an interesting sort of paired view of perhaps a truer picture of, uh, of development for the 21st century. The interesting thing was that um, I found that uh, publishing this index, it attracted a certain amount of attention. That David mentioned in his introduction that I have a TED talk, which has got some incredible number of views, over 7 million now on, on, uh, on TED.com and another 4 or 5 million on YouTube. And that was entirely as a result of me launching the first edition of the Good Country Index at a TED event. I don't think it was anything to do with how utterly brilliant my talk was, although I thought it was quite good, but it was mainly to do with the fact that people seem to be, or rather a certain type of person, seem to be fascinated by this idea that countries could be measured in a new way instead of constantly asking how well is this country doing here at last was somebody asking how much is this country doing which seemed to be the emblematic question to be asking about countries in the 21st century um, and i started getting thousands upon thousands upon thousands of emails from people who'd seen the ted talk saying i want to live in a good country and their emails were strikingly similar these people described themselves in ways which sounded very familiar to me they described themselves as global citizens they said i'm a citizen of a member of humanity a citizen of the of the world first and a citizen of my own country second or third or ninth equal if they were british very often and they said things like 
um, I don't care too much about domestic politics. I hardly even know whether to vote anymore because it seems to me that domestic politics is just a bunch of overgrown schoolboys squabbling about relatively insignificant domestic issues. And nobody ever talks about the important stuff, the existential stuff like climate change and migration and pandemics. Before the pandemic came along, we were talking about this. And it occurred to me that here was a personality type, a true character type. And I did some further analysis on this with a colleague of mine, and we discovered that this is a type which probably hadn't been observed before, or at least not very closely, which we call natural cosmopolitans. And we tried to put a number on them, and we discovered that this, this was the 18,000 or so emails I'd received was the tip of a pretty substantial iceberg absolutely decidedly no less than 10% of the world's adult population could be described as a hardcore natural cosmopolitan. Now 10% of the world's adult population, I don't need to remind you, is about 700 million people. If that were a country, it would be the third largest country on the planet after India and China. That's a cohort that could really start moving the world, society in general, towards the kinds of attitudes and values and behaviors that we really need if we're going to start fixing some of these grand challenges. And I suppose that's really the, the point that I wanted to get to with this little history. We're facing um, any number of challenges at the moment, but certainly 30 very significant ones. And the one thing that they all have in common is that they are all globalized. They are all beyond the reach of any individual country to be able to tackle. China can't fix climate change. America can't fix uh, um, narco trafficking, neither, neither can Mexico. Uh, the European Union can't fix migration. These are all uh, whack-a-mole problems. You push them down in one country, they'll pop up in another. And therefore, self-evidently, if we want to fix them, we need to fix them collectively and collaboratively. And we don't do that. The countries of the world, generally speaking, only work together very reluctantly, very grudgingly, and in a very fragmentary um, and slightly ineffectual way. Otherwise, we'd have made more progress against uh, most of the challenges than we have today. Coronavirus was a perfect example. We've got off to a really, really slow start tackling this as a global community. And that's despite the UN. It's despite the avowed multilateralism of so many governments. And I think that fundamentally, this is a cultural problem. The simple fact of the matter is that the nations of the earth are still configured pretty much the way they were when the Treaty of Westphalia was signed in the 17th century. We are still warring, competing tribes. We may not hack each other to death with axes anymore, but the competition, the age of competition we live in today, is still in all tense, intents and purposes motivated by the same desires and the same views of life on earth as the age of conflict was before it. What we need is to move into the third age, the age of collaboration, where we understand that our fundamental primary duty is to collaborate, to collaborate first and then to compete. Now, don't get me wrong, I'm not saying that competition is a bad thing. Competition is a very much part of who we are. It's part of who I am. We all can enjoy and benefit from competition. It has, of course, lifted billions of people out of poverty. Competition, as I always say, is only a problem when it becomes the only altar at which we worship. And that, I think, has been the problem for the last 80 years or so. Industry, ironically, it was that proved to us back in the 70s that there's a thing called cooperation, where you can wisely harmonize collaboration, cooperation, and, co and, and, uh, and competition together and create something very effective and very productive. And I think all I'm really saying is that that's an experiment that's long, long overdue for the nation state. We need to find ways of changing the culture of governance from one that's fundamentally competitive to one that's fundamentally collaborative. Now, I said, and I'll finish at this point, that there were two uh, causes for all of the challenges that we're facing in the world today. What I've spoken about up until now is the first one, which is the way that countries behave. But also, ir irrefutably, it's got a lot to do with the way that people behave. We are all of us responsible for all of those challenges because the other thing that they have in common is that they're all caused by human behaviors. And if you trace back the grand challenge of climate change or pandemics or whatever it is to the human behavior that's caused it, you can then trace that back to the human education that has failed somehow in the educational sense to inoculate us against those behaviors. So the answer very simply and very briefly to changing the way that humanity behaves is to start bringing up people in a way that's actually suitable for the massively interdependent and interconnected world in which we're now living. We need a new generation of human beings. 
to make adults change the way they see the world and the way they behave is enormously, monstrously difficult. But to train children to see the world in a particular way is scarily easy. Social engineering is very easy, and that's why the children's education is so carefully and rightly protected. But what I'm working on now is a project called The Good Generation, which is basically designed to achieve a fully global consensus on the basic, basic set of values, virtues, and skill sets that we all of us agree, no matter what our cultural and religious and geographical and linguistic differences are, that we all want our children to learn as they're growing up so that we have a generation that runs towards the global challenges in a few years time, instead of doing what my generation has done, which is to run away from them. So there are a few thoughts uh, to get the conversation started. Thank you. Many thanks indeed, Simon. Lots to think about. And thanks to the audience for paying a lot of attention. You now have a chance to add some questions to the Q&A window. If there's something you want to prioritize in our discussion, you also have a chance to vote for other people's uh, comments there. If you think uh, there's a question in the Q&A window that you would like to hear the answer of, or if it hasn't been adequately covered already. But, uh, Simon, you, you talk about agreeing a set of values that uh, the whole world, in a sense, could get behind. Isn't that a very ambitious, uh, naively ambitious thing? Is there any example you can point to where people from different cultures have managed to agree, something that transcends their individual backgrounds? Yeah, uh, you're, you're right. It is absolutely uh, ambitious um, and consciously so. Um, I think when the challenges are as great as the challenges we're facing today, then nothing less than ambition uh, is, is appropriate. Um, and yes, there are good examples. Um, uh, I'm always tempted to say, trust me, I'm an anthropologist. Um, people are very frightened of cultural differences and tend to exaggerate how important they, they are. Uh, it's easily done because they can seem very important, but there's enough history to show that when it's absolutely necessary for humanity to agree um, on a few common principles, we can do it. The best example, I think, is, is the Universal Declaration of Human Rights from 1948 which is um, in many ways a really beautiful document. Um, it's, it's, it's a very moving piece of work. And it shows that when things are really very bad and everybody acknowledges that they're bad, we can, as a species, agree on things that are culturally very sensitive. Uh, human rights, I would argue, is more controversial even than the education of children. And we managed to do that. Um, and in some ways, the world of 1948 is not so very different from the, from the world of 2020. Well, you take the UN Charter in 1945, again, um, very, very easy uh, to have said before that, we'll never do it, it won't be possible. People can't agree on these things. And yet they did, with patient diplomacy, you can do it. So I think it's, I think it's really, really worth having a try. Um, and the indication so far with some of the pilots we've been doing is that it isn't actually all that difficult. Um, to come up with some basic, I'm very careful always never to say values on its own because the very idea of values is somewhat Western in origin. The values, the virtues, the principles and the skill sets which, which children all need. You really only have to look at the world's major religions to see how common the basic virtues and values are. They pop up in almost every religion. And it's interesting how modern <laughs> some of them are. For example, you know, all men and women are your brothers and sisters. This is common to almost every religion. And isn't that the message that we need to, to bring up children with today if we want to avoid othering and problems with migration and problems with racism and so on and so forth? Or uh, God gave us the natural world for us to look after it, I think is common to pretty much every religion. Isn't that what we need basically to help tackle climate change and species loss and ecosystem loss and all the rest of it? So we've known most of these things forever and ever and ever, but I think the problem is that we've been too piecemeal in the way that we teach them to children. I'll take questions from the window in a minute, but one more from me just now. Simon, haven't there been so many other initiatives to improve education? Mm -hmm. Uh, what makes you think that your initiative will take more traction? Is it because you're going to take it to the United Nations and get their support, or do you have something else in mind? Well, I think the, the most important thing uh, to say about that, David, is that we don't want to compete with what's already out there. Um, yet another educational syllabus, yet another provider of educational materials is really not the thing that the world le needs right now. There's an enormous amount of good stuff out there. I think what we need is an organization that uh, is able to bring all of that together um, into a joined up initiative. Um, it's precisely because there are so many projects of this sort out there and have been over the last 30, 40 years, 
that makes this venture possible because it proves over and over again that when you do teach children these things, then they do run towards the challenges. I mean, look at Greta Thunberg. She's the, the classic example. In Swedish schools, they teach about climate change. Before Greta has even left school, she's running towards climate change and being more effective as a climate change advocate than most of, most of us have been in our entire lives. So we know it works, it's, uh, and, and all of those other projects just prove it. But what there's never been is an attempt to corral it all together and make it happen right now and everywhere. So that's the purpose of the good generation. And yes, of course, with UN support, we're speaking to UNESCO uh, on a regular basis about doing this alongside what they're doing. But what we can do because we're not a UN agency is to try to get a bit of a global popular movement going so that people are, are asking for this, they're enthusiastic about it, um, and that we don't have to try and shove it down their throats by means of international law or intergovernmental agreements, which are very, very hard to obtain and then are often forgotten, forgotten as soon as they're signed. You mentioned that there's roughly 10% of the world population that you see as being naturally cosmopolitan, being instinctively inclined to collaborate and think on global issues rather than locally. But what about the other 90%? Uh, I'm gonna take a question, it's top of the list. It's from Iwa Chodorowska. Uh, she says, it's a great topic, but don't you think at the bottom of all of this is all of these ills is human greed? greed for power, money, influence, material goods, etc. Hmm. Uh, until this is dealt with, then there's no real chance for a change for the better. Yeah, um, I'm somewhat sympathetic to that view, um, but I, I'm, I'm fairly hopeful nonetheless. Let me answer the bit about the 90% first. Um, saying that 10% of the world's population are natural cosmopolitan certainly does not mean that 90% of the world don't want world peace don't want people to agree, don't believe in collaboration or that they're in any sense bad. Um, they just don't happen to have that particularly powerful mindset, which instinctively makes them uh, have a, a global view. And by the way, that 10% is it, it's not restricted to a particular demographic. These are not, it doesn't correlate with education. It doesn't correlate with income. It's not to anticipate a question that often occurs, that this is just the 10% who spend their days watching TED Talks and are rich and leisured enough to be able to afford to think so generously. No, it's more or less randomly distributed. Um, and the 90% the are not the opposite of the 10%. They're just not quite so far along that curve. I mean, there have been other stu studies, perhaps slightly less detailed ones conducted in recent years that ask people whether they see themselves as being a member of the human race. And you get the majority, you get over 50%, if that's the only question you're asking. So uh, it's not 10% against the rest or anything of the sort. There's a 10% really, really committed vanguard. Um, and then there's probably another, oh, at least 50 or 60% who share those views, but it's just not the driving force of their, of their character. So to get to Ava's question about, about greed, yes, absolutely. But I think that we all of us um, have um, all kinds of um, conflicting emotions and conflicting drives within us. And uh, one of the reasons why education is probably the key to all of these is because it teaches us at an early age when we're still capable of uh, amending our characters, when we're still forming our characters, to be aware of both of those sides, to acknowledge them, not to hate them or to tackle them necessarily, but just to keep them in a healthy balance. And I think you become very aware of greed when somebody doesn't have that in a healthy balance against whatever the opposite is, a sense of stewardship, a sense of uh, global belonging. We have dozens and dozens of these opposite pairs within our nature that need to be uh, correctly balanced. And that's the role of education. And that's why I think, uh, you know, in this domain, almost whatever the question is, the answer is education. Let's follow on with uh, another question about the 10% of people who are hardcore natural cosmopolitans. Deborah McKenzie, who, by the way, spoke at London Futurist in the previous event. So uh, th thanks for joining in again, Deborah. She says that there are quite a few, maybe 10% or more, uh, hardcore people who regard cosmopolitans as citizens of nowhere. You must have heard this phrase, that uh, citizens of nowhere are a threat to many, to many people who see themselves as citizens of somewhere. Mm. Uh, a lot of these attitudes seem to be deep personality uh, mm. types. Mm. 
perhaps Theresa May, the former British Prime Minister, might fit into that camp of uh, being very suspicious of these citizens of yeah. uh, nowhere. How do we deal with that? What's your assessment of that? Well, again, I, I, th I think it's um, I think it's absolutely essential that um, where you do have people who have almost opposite character types, and that is a f it is a fact, it does exist, that we acknowledge each other. Um, there's a there's a story that's been going around now for quite a few years um, that humanity is divided into basically two tribes who are called globalists and localists, somewhat uh, somewhat similar kind of construction. And the story is that we are each other's natural enemies and we should be spending all our waking hours screaming hate at each other on social media. I regard this as one of the most dangerous ideas in the world at the moment um, because it makes fools of all of us. The reality as I perceive it is that um, that um, committed uh, localist uh, is, not a, is not a member of an enemy tribe, it's just you on a different day. And if we stop to think about it, we can all sympathize with the opposite view, almost all of us. I know exactly what it feels like to be a localist. In many senses, I am a localist. There's a slightly higher proportion of globalists in my makeup, just I don't even know why, but I find this stuff fascinating. I spend so much of my time worrying about things at the planetary level, I tend to ignore the needs of the little village that I live in, and I'm constantly in trouble for not being on the parish council and so forth. But then the people who are on the parish council and worry intensely about our village, they're so busy doing that, that they're not worried so much about the planet or the climate. Now, I'm glad they're there and I'm glad they're doing that work. And I hope they're glad that I'm here and doing this work. You couldn't, you, you, you could look all day and not find a better example for where we need to be collaborating uh, rather than competing. And I think what we need to do is to see, go as far as we can in removing the sense of these being opposed to tribes or ideologies. It's so, so, so easy to take these um, conflicting worldviews somewhat incompatible worldviews, left-wing and right-wing, globalist and localist, whatever it is, cosmopolitan and not cosmopolitan, and see them as being character types and seeing them as being intrinsically hostile to each other, but it doesn't have to be like that. And we all know it doesn't have to be like that. We all remember when it wasn't like that. It's become like that really quite rapidly and quite, quite recently. So in a way, the question is an important reminder to me to be very careful when I'm talking about these things that I don't make it sound, and perhaps I sometimes do, as if that 10% are in some sense an elite who are going to save the world and who are going to convert everybody else to their mindset. That really isn't what I mean at all. What I do mean is that those people are actually perhaps quite useful in helping other people to see the value and the beauty of that way of looking at the world, and that it doesn't necessarily mean you have to abandon your love for your own country. Absolutely not. What are good examples of countries doing things that have uh, served the world uh, and served themselves at the same time, and uh, maybe even improved their brand or their, their nation image as a result? Mm. It's, it's, very... it's more concrete. Yeah, it's, um, it's frustratingly difficult to find examples. I mean, this has been my work for the last 20 years. And if I'm honest about it, um, there are only just a handful of individual policies that I can point to where I've said this government saw the need for this and did it. Um, for example, um, years ago, I was advising the government of Austria and I persuaded them instead of just um, getting pledges when they had floods in Bangladesh and Austria wanted to help. Um, getting pledges from other countries and then paying out a lot of money to help the people of Bangladesh after the flood had happened. But maybe it would make more sense if Austria took out an insurance policy for Bangladesh before the floods happened and paid the premium on it. And it would likely be cheaper, more predictable and more effective. Um, and so Austria have been piloting that approach. It's a good example, I think, of how um, you can... Um, you can, you can merge this idea of cooperating and collaborating with other countries. And it also ends up sometimes with more imaginative thinking than you would have done otherwise. So uh, it, was, it was quite, uh, quite a, uh, ironic in a way. A few years ago, I decided I would write a policy playbook, which would be a collection of all the best policies in the world over the last 20 or 50 years that would demonstrate to governments how you can effectively harmonize domestic and international responsibilities and do good both at home and abroad. And um, I started researching it and after about six years, I think I'd found six examples. So uh, that might be rather off-putting. You might say, okay, well, it's obviously impossible to do that. But my own experience as a policy advisor showed me on the contrary that it really does work. 
And in a way, it was quite exciting that I could only find six examples because it shows how seldom governments ever try this. And it's partly because irrespective of where, what your, your ideological background is, as soon as you get to the place where you're running a country, you seem to fall into this common error of believing that those two things are antithetical to each other. Whatever you do that's good for the environment is going to slow down your own economic growth. Whatever you do for your own people is going to harm somebody else in some other country. So let's not even try. And it's extraordinary how when you're talking to governments, they, they will just dismiss the whole idea wholesale and say it can't work. It's just naive. Uh, it's us or them. America first, everybody else last. Um, and yet, if they only try, they begin to see that there's a whole world of collaborative policy making out there, which benefits your domestic thinking and your domestic policy making. The more you engage, the more you cooperate, the more you collaborate, the more you listen to other countries and their examples. Something I, I call entrepreneurial multilateralism, where you just bring together groups of countries almost randomly and say, let's try and fix our domestic problem in a group, an international group. And suddenly, because of their different backgrounds, their different experiences, you're coming up with more solutions than you would if it was just people from the same background. And then you come up with solutions for five or six countries instead of just one. So it's a win-win. And what I spend much of my life doing is trying to demonstrate to governments that actually this is a better way of making policy than just looking inwards and occasionally remembering to look outwards. You do both all the time. This example of countries working together, entrepreneurial multilateralism, are you thinking of something like uh, New Zealand and Scotland and maybe is it Iceland, uh, mm. whose various leaders have been inspired by what each other have done and uh, saying, mm. let's put uh, well-being onto the top level of agenda uh, mechanisms as well as uh, GDP? Definitely. That, that, that particular um, agreement uh, is definitely a step in the right direction. I would say that it's, um, it's far from illustrating how far that one, co one could go. Um, first of all, uh, they're only talking about separately measuring their individual progress and including measurements of well-being alongside the economic measurements, which is something that we've been discussing, um, the, the, the world of economics has been discussing for, what, 60 years now? So it's great if three countries are actually doing it, but it's triple unilateralism rather than true multilateralism they're only still measuring their own country's performance. So it's still somewhat inward looking, but it's a whole lot better than them not doing it in the first place. The other thing that I would say is um, one could improve on would be to start getting not so obviously like-minded countries, but to start bringing in some from the developing world, some that come from with, with very different cultural backgrounds. A, because that tends to increase the quality of the ideas that you come up with collectively, and B, because it has more of an impact. I mean, everybody knows that New Zealand and Scotland and was it Iceland or Finland? I can't remember, but that they're broadly in the same category of countries. They're all progressive liberal thinkers. And in a way, it's not such a powerful demonstration of what good globalization could be. But if one of them had been Qatar and the other one had been Eritrea and the other one had been Guatemala, that would be exciting and no less difficult, I think. Just a small uh, support for that. And recently I've been in quite a few international events with people from Malaysia mm -hmm. and another set of events with people in Nigeria. And uh, obviously we have different uh, issues that we bring to the discussion, but uh, it's refreshing how we can inspire each other in these yeah. uh, discussions. Yeah. And let's not forget, this is, this is one of the good sides of globalization. You know, there's, a, there's no question that we've allowed, we politicians and corporations primarily have allowed globalization to run out of control and to create far more injustice and inequality than it really should have done. But it doesn't mean that everything about globalization is bad. And one of the best things about globalization by stirring up the gene pool in this way is that it's put more the potential for more creativity and innovation at our fingertips than humanity has ever had in the past before. And I think it's important to celebrate and to make use of that, to instrumentalize it, because it is a massive, massive advantage. We have more capability of solving exotic problems than we've ever had at any earlier stage of globalization. A couple of housekeeping points. People are asking if the video of this will be available. People finding the discussion so rich, they'd like to look at it again. Yes, it will be on the London Futurist YouTube channel. And in terms of asking questions, uh, 
uh, please do that in the Q&A window where you also have a chance to vote. There's quite a lot of questions in there now. We're not going to get around to all of them, so please pick the ones you would like us to address next. The one that's top of the list now is from Liam <laughs> Myron, who says he is a teacher, and so he is naturally interested to hear more about this uh, consensus-building exercise to mm. create a syllabus. Uh, you mentioned pilots. Uh, can you say more about how that is going and how people might uh, get involved? Absolutely. I'm just putting um, the URL of my website on there. Um, so if anybody wants to see any more about the Good Country Index uh, or the Good Generation or the Global Vote, which is a little platform that enables people anywhere in the world to vote on the elections of other countries, um, there's all, all the stuff is on there. There's not very much... Um, in the public domain yet about the good generation because it's in its very, very early stages. There's a page on the website there that shows the launch video I did at the uh, European Association of International Educators in Helsinki last year. So that's a good sort of 20 minute talk about how the good generation is going to work. Um, I'm very, very keen to, um, to speak to people who would like to help and would like to contribute in any way. So let me also just put my email address here, if I may, David. Please um, do. If anybody else would like to um, get in touch with me, uh, I'd, I'd love to hear from you. And the other, can I also, am I allowed to do a tiny promo for my book, David? Oh, please do, yes. Thank you. Um, as David mentioned, I have just written a book called The Good Country Equation, which is the long version of all of this stuff. And my publishers have very kindly said, I told them I was doing this talk, and they've said that any uh, attendees who click on that link, which I've just put on the chat page, you get a 30% discount on the digital editions of the book. So that's either the ebook or the audio book uh, narrated by yours truly. Uh, if you want a paperback, I'm afraid you still have to go to uh, Amazon or alternatives. And there are alternatives to Amazon for those who don't want to buy from them. Well, I listened to the audio version and it was very engaging, I have to say. It's a human uh, book in that there are lots of human stories of uh, human mishaps and mild misunderstandings and uh, figuring things out together and uh, striking up relationships and insights arising often in unexpected ways. So it's very engaging. I started taking notes about halfway through and the notes got more and more uh, dense as I, as I went through, as I realized that the various threads of the book uh, were building into this uh, bigger, simple equation, which uh, you, you briefly mentioned already. Yes, I mean, I wrote the book more as an adventure story than as a textbook, because um, as I say right at the beginning, part of the problem with this, this whole topic is that it is by definition a topic that everybody needs to understand because everybody's going to be part of fixing it. And yet, almost all the books I've ever read on the grand challenges are, they're very, very good, most of them, but gosh, you need to concentrate hard. And they're not exactly very readable. Um, and I often give up before I get to the end just because my brain can't, can't manage them. So I thought, well, I'll write this one with a plot and with characters and with locations so that it's a bit more like a novel and it's got a story to it and it's got some humor in it because one of the things I always say is, just because this stuff is important doesn't mean it doesn't mean it has to be boring um, and if it's boring people won't engage and if people don't engage then everything's going to get worse so that that seems logical to me but I'm conscious I didn't I didn't really address the the question about the good generation uh, except to say that it's in very early stages the the interesting thing about getting the global consensus on these virtues and values is that um, I've had recent experience of using some AI software that makes that so much more satisfactory a process than it has been in the past. Um, there was a, um, a platform that I used in a, in a previous project called Remesh, which is basically a kind of super moderator. Um, and it enables you to do um, qualitative advertising, uh, sorry, qualitative uh, uh, research at the level, at the scale of quantitative. So if you want to have a natural language, open-ended proper discussion with 6 million people, you can do it. Um, you don't have to reduce it to silly binary questions and get people to vote, which of course shreds any um, nuanced argument to bits. What you can now do is you can use natural language. And what the AI moderating software does is uh, it basically crunches down all of those millions and millions of different views into clusters of um, opinion 
and viewpoint, which then enables you as a human moderator to look at it and say, oh, okay, I get it. Amongst these 6 million people, we've basically got five viewpoints here. And this is where they overlap. And this is where they contradict. And that to me is little short of miraculous. Um, it's a very, very powerful tool. And that's one of the tools we're going to be using. Remesh, is that what you called it? Remesh, it's also the name of the company that makes it. They're based in New York, R-E-M-E-S-H. Um, there are others on the market now. And in the more than a year since I used that program, uh, I should think that many others have come along. And I'm sure that Remesh's own uh, platform is, is much more sophisticated now. But this stuff is coming on so quickly. There are questions about uh, other systems of collaboration. Uh, mm. For example, scientists uh, collaborate. Mm. Uh, universities tend to collaborate. Phil Shepard uh, comments that he's been struck by the rapid building of collaborative thinking by scientists around the world recently, uh, often bypassing politicians. Mm. Do you think that the current pandemic will make a difference to the prospects of greater global collaborations? Uh, yes and no. Um, it's absolutely correct that one of the, uh, the, the best examples of how well humanity collaborates, how efficiently and effectively it collaborates in the modern age, is through um, academic and scientific collaboration. Why? Well, it may be just as simple as the fact that the ideology doesn't get in the way, um, by definition, uh, in scientific inquiry and academia. Um, well, perhaps academia more broadly it can do. But it's an example to us all of how um, relatively frictionless and how very productive um, cross-border collaboration can really be. And it's one of the models that we need, to, we need to, uh, to, to take as our guide. In terms of what the pandemic has done uh, for it, I think the pandemic, um, once we've got over the, the, the suffering and the horror, those of us that are able to, um, I think some of the things that we'll realize were good about it are one, that it proved to all of us in the most dramatic way that we, the human species, have no special dispensation to survive. I think all of us, if, you, if you'd asked us, literally most of us would have said, no, of course we can be wiped out at any moment, but did we really believe it until the pandemic came along? And just being confronted with our own mortality in that way to realize, my God, we could, go, we could become extinct, just through an accident of, 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 of epidemiology. That's so important because it helps enormously, I think, or will prove to have helped enormously in the fight against climate change and the behaviors that cause it and make it worse. Because one of the things that was missing from the battle against climate change is the deeply rooted conviction that it could end us all. And now we know what that feels like, and that's so very important. I think also the interesting thing about the pandemic um, is to do with this question of, um, large numbers of people collaborating against a common enemy. And we know from reading history that human beings tend to get together when there is the perception or the reality of a common foe. Um, that's one of the crucibles of unity um, and always has been. It's also one of the reasons why it, the classic approach of all tyrants and dictators um, always uh, dream up, cook up, take and exaggerate a common enemy in order to create this kind of false unity. Um, it's very often another race, another religion, another tribe, whatever it is. And the problem with climate change was that we as a human species somehow never really saw uh, catastrophic climate change as being an enemy that we could understand or perceive as an enemy. Too far away, too abstract, too difficult. Even when the signs are all around us, somehow we were never anywhere near the tipping point. The pandemic is different. The pandemic is something we can anthropomorphize. Donald Trump, with his unfailing genius for finding the right phrase, uh, talked about it as the unseen enemy. And that's, uh, that also has given us a sense of us, the human race, battling against a single other. Um, how we bring that to bear against climate change, I'm not quite sure, but it remains to be seen. So that's been very useful. Um, and is it good for multilateralism? Well, that depends on what your view was before the pandemic, I'm afraid. The people who thought that multilateralism is a good thing, as I did, and thought that we didn't have enough of it, for us, the pandemic is just further proof that we need even more. For the people who never believed in or were starting to disbelieve in multilateralism, pandemic is the proof uh, that globalization was a bad thing. Uh, and indeed, they're right. The pandemic wouldn't have happened if we'd had no globalization. So you can look at it either way. Both are correct. 
but one is slightly more of a long-term opportunity than the other if you believe in multilateralism, I think. So would you propose that the education syllabus would include a whole section on climate change and a whole section on multilateralism, or would you have a different approach to that? Um, I'm actually not super keen on getting into the conversation about what the syllabus should be, um, because syllabuses really are um, a somewhat local matter. And the one thing the good generation, I suspect, will not be involved in is writing syllabuses or uh, dictating content for syllabuses. What we'll be probably much more likely to be doing is trying to have some influence over the way that those materials are created in the first place by the people who create them. Um, that's vague, not because I'm trying to be secretive about it, but just because we honestly haven't made up our minds yet. Um, having said all that, my own experience, my limited experience of education is uh, when I worked as a teacher, I found that um, it was always better to come at things uh, transversely, um, sideways rather than head on. So there is some experience out there which shows that if you try and teach people uh, a subject like tolerance or global citizenship directly, it often doesn't produce as good results as you hoped. And that's at least partly because it isn't really a subject. It's a thing, it's a mindset that you want your children to have, but that doesn't mean you can teach it to them. You can't just deliver it to them. It's much better to teach it, as I say, transversally. So what I did with my own children, because I didn't want them to grow up with that particular disability of racism, um, I taught them cultural anthropology or a, or a simplified version of it when they were about seven or eight. Um, and it worked extraordinarily well because what happens is that you would still in them a scientific pride in understanding the technicalities of cultural difference. And what that does is it makes it impossible for you to be prejudiced. Uh, it, it starves the environment of oxygen for the kind of ignorance or laziness that's necessary in order for you to be intolerant. Um, and so instilling scientific pride in the same, by the same token, it might work better to teach children meteorology or oceanography than to try and teach them about sustainable behavior. Um, so I have a sort of a preference for that fluoride in the tap water approach that you don't even realize it's there, you can't taste it, you can't smell it, but it's doing you good. However sinister that might be in the wrong hands, I think that is the right way to do it. Could you give us a 60 second snapshot of the kinds of things you spoke to your seven year olds about cultural anthropology? What was there? The... I, I, I used uh, Hofstadter's Five Dimensions of Culture, um, which anybody who's not, uh, who's not familiar with it, I'll just pop his name down in here. Uh, he's, he's called Gert Hofstede, a uh, Dutch anthropologist um, who devised this beautifully simplified uh, model of cultural difference, which is called the five dimensions of culture. Um, most of his initial research is very narrow. It was all done within IBM, who he was consulting for back in the 60s when he created the model. Um, it would be great if somebody were to rerun on a on a big scale, some of this research amongst general populations. Nonetheless, because he's a bit of a genius, the model that he derived from the research he did amongst professional people at IBM in the 1960s, nonetheless has held good. Um, and it's very, very powerful. It's just basically a series of, um, of, of couples of attributes, which he calls the software of the mind, um, the software of society. So for example, masculine feminine, um, in this specific context, the masculine societies are the ones like uh, Britain or the United States, where most of the values within society gear towards shows of power and dominance uh, and success. Feminine societies like uh, Thailand or Sweden, where um, caring about each other, caring about nature, uh, nurturing generally, protecting the weak, are considered to be more like societally shared values. That all sounds very sexist. And if it does, I apologize for traducing Hofstede. You need to read the book to understand exactly what he means there. It isn't, I believe, sexist at all. I think it's quite quite illuminating. Right. Um, Seven-year-olds can uh, thrive on that kind of ideas. Uh, Seven-year-olds, if you, if you teach it right, find it deeply fascinating. Right. Um, it, it may have worked with mine because they were in a multicultural environment at right. the time. And so there was plenty going on around them that they could relate it to. Um, if you were unlucky enough to, to, to be a seven-year-old in a monocultural environment, it might be a little harder, but certainly not impossible. Okay. Uh, a couple of more critical negative questions, uh, perhaps. Irwin Owen says, mm. actually, there's a huge degree of inequality across the world, even mm. in the richest countries. 
Mm. And many people do have to focus entirely on their own survival. Mm. How can we expect the human majority to be focused on wider scale transformation and improvement when they are struggling to even feed themselves? Yeah. Do you have some sympathy for that? Oh, God, absolutely. I mean, it's an absolutely essential point. I suppose the, um, leaving aside the individuals just for a moment, but at the national level, um, the point that I've spent much of the last 20 years uh, trying to get across to governments is that these two things are not mutually exclusive and we can't allow them to become so. Um, the idea, for example, that uh, you can only expect a country to start thinking about the world outside its borders when it can afford to do so, when it's, it's, it's raised its own population to a level of, of, of prosperity, justice, peace and equality, that then they can start thinking about everybody else. I think that's a really, really false and quite dangerous view. And that's the reason really why we're in the mess we're in at the moment, because experience shows that no country ever believes that it's achieved a sufficient level of prosperity to start worrying about everybody else. My argument is very much that everybody should do that at the same time. Um, because doing so helps development. That's the whole point. And closing your eyes to the benefits that international engagement can bring to uh, a, a, a country with a low state of economic development is closing down opportunities for growth and for faster development. Um, and there are a number of reasons for this, but the two which I touched on in my talk, let me remind you, the first one was that the more a country engages with the international community, and by engaging, I don't mean charity, I'll come back to that in a moment, but the more it engages with the international community, the more highly regarded it will be by the international community, the better known. That in turn will improve the country's image and improving the country's image will produce more foreign revenue. That's all proven um, and it works. But on a more subtler level, let me remind you, the, also, the other point I made is that it does also create better decision making. It's more fertile, it's more productive, and all of those relationships help. So one of the best results that came out of the first edition of the Good Country Index in 2014 was the fact that Kenya um, came in to the top 30. Um, uh, and um, Moldova came in the top 30 in the last edition. Regularly, we have countries at a relatively low stage of economic development, able to prove, at least according to the Good Country Index um, schema, that they are contributing um, to the world outside their borders well above average. And that's simply because this is not uh, based, as many people seem to assume it must be, on the 19th century philanthropic idea that all the problems in the world come from the fact that there are too many dollars above the equator and too few dollars below it. And if we can just transfer as much spare cash as possible to the people below the equator, then all the problems of the world will go away. Um, that's a very, very pervasive view, even if it's not usually expressed in such an idiotic way. Now, there are what maybe two indicators in the Good Country Index amongst the 35 that are directly a measure of how much money countries spend on helping other countries. There's food aid and there's economic development assistance, but they are divided by GDP. So they're expressed, expressed as a proportion of what the country can afford, not in absolute terms. But that's just two out of 35 indicators. Everything else is more about how you benefit mutually from engaging more fully and more imaginatively with the international community. So the very, very last thing I'm suggesting is that poor countries should somehow, should somehow divert their attention from the very real problems of their own people and their own territory and start worrying about everybody else. That's simply not the model that I'm, I'm, I'm prescribing at all. What I'm saying is that laying yourself open to the advantages that globalization brings, letting people help, bringing in uh, collaboration and cooperation from every level of economic development within the international community brings benefits. Receiving aid is as much a way of benefiting from the international community as is giving aid, and the two are worth the same. You may not be able to answer this, but do you recall what it was that Moldova did or Kenya did to give them that uh, comparatively high ranking despite being economically uh, no. struggled? No, but it's relatively easy to, to, to check it out. Um, you, all you have to do is just basically go on to the, to the website, you click on the country, and then you can see the seven uh, categories and the 35 sub-indicators. And there's a little graph that shows whether they're above or below average for that country. Um, on a hunch, I would say that it was probably something to do with environmental protection, um, because both countries have relatively small economies and probably, therefore, are not uh, polluting very much. 
um, they're almost certainly not exporting hazardous chemicals outside their own borders or things like that. And it uh, may well also be something to do with culture. The culture section is one that causes people a lot of anxiety because they cannot but see it as being somehow a measure of how much culture, culture that country has allegedly got. And this is not the case. It is simply of a proportion of the culture that the country has, how effective and how generous are they at sharing it outside their borders. So you could have at the top of the list, and you often do, a country that's not associated with massive cultural production at all, but still does more to share it than countries with loads and loads of culture. Another slightly uh, sceptical question is one from Cornelius Holtorf, hmm. again at the top of the list. Is your index not mm. fostering even more national competition between mm. states? And is it not open to global spin doctoring and international PR rather than uh, genuinely promoting the sustained change that you talk about? Yeah, absolutely, Cornelius. I agree with you 100%. Um, the, I'm very conscious of the fact that a ranked index is a competitive tool. But as I said before, I'm not against competition. I think competition is a very valuable instinct. Um, and it needs to be leveraged where we can. I find that the older I get, the less concerned I am with countries' motivations for behaving in the right way. Um, if, they're, if they're behaving, if they're doing good stuff just because they think it will benefit their image, that's fine by me. We're in an emergency situation here, and I don't think we can afford to be too critical about why countries do things as long as they do them. So if the Good Country Index persuades countries to try harder to contribute more to the world outside their borders just because they want to rank higher than their enemies in the Good Country Index, that's fine by me as long as they're doing it. Um, and there's a funny thing about human nature that very often people do the right thing for the wrong reason the first time round, but then as soon as they begin to experience uh, the accolades that this brings them, they become, uh, they become uh, addicted to it. And they'll start doing absolutely anything, even being genuinely good if that's what it costs in order to maintain that sense. So I'm prepared to give people a bit of grace in, in, this, in this context. Um, uh, yes, it's imperfect in so many ways. Uh, and yes, it is subject to an awful lot of spin doctrine. The latest edition came out last Wednesday, Sweden won. And the way that some other countries were talking in their media about the fact that they came 133rd or something, you'd think they'd won. Um, and again, I just don't mind because the important thing is that the, the Good Country index is, index is achieving its primary task. Its primary task is to try to start the big job of changing the way that people talk about countries and their purpose. Instead of forever asking how well is this country doing, at least people are now saying how much is this country doing, whether they're telling the truth or whether they're lying, whether they're exaggerating, whether they're competing, I don't care. The frame of the discussion has changed. Every day I get tens of uh, emails from angry people all over the world um, screaming at me because I have um, somehow deliberately, obviously deliberately ranked the country they love too low um, or the country they hate too high. And I always say to them at the end of what ends up usually being quite a productive conversation, look, it's working, okay? We're now having a conversation about why, how much your favorite country is doing instead of how well your favorite country is doing. And those are the conversations we need to have. So it's thoroughly, thoroughly imperfect. I mean, the Good Country Index as a, as a piece of statistical analysis leaves an enormous amount to be desired. All it can do, mainly because of a shortage of good data on this stuff, but all it can do is shine a little torch in the corner of a very large, very dark field, but better to turn on the torch than keep it in your pocket. Michael Northcott asks about why the focus on physical countries. Hmm. When today, a nation state includes territory, population, government, legitimacy, sovereignty. Yeah. But in this era of emerging digital currencies, digital identity, and so on, is the requirement for physical territory still necessary? Could a virtual nation state serve the cosmopolitan 10% better? That was the original idea. Um, in uh, 2018, uh, together with uh, my then co-founder, we launched something we called The Good Country. And the idea was that it was indeed a virtual country on the, on the internet. And uh, we, we charged people uh, $5 a year in taxes. Um, on the, based on the calculation that we had 760 million citizens all paying five dollars uh, we'd have an annual budget equivalent to the GDP of Sierra Leone and we'd really be able to uh, achieve some influence in the international community better I think to be a country uh, in the scrum to use the, the rugby term um, 
than yet another campaigning organization standing on the sidelines and trying to persuade, usually ineffectually, trying to persuade governments to change. Um, it was a very good idea, I think, um, and a very bold idea. Um, I slightly underestimated how long it would take and how much it would cost to actually build that thing and fill it with citizens. Um, but it's an idea I, I, still, I still think was a good and powerful one. And who knows, somebody else may do it and make it work. I hope they do. And what about uh, there are other very large international powers like mm -hmm. companies or indeed yeah. universities? Um, yeah. How, how should they be brought into this evaluation? Well, that's where I'm going next. Um, the, the good country equation um, is, as I said, it's, it's based on this idea that we need a change in the culture of governance from fundamentally uh, competitive to fundamentally collaborative. And as I see it, there are basically three areas that influence uh, human culture on this level. The first one is countries and their governments, and also to a degree cities and regions. And that's what the, the, the good country equation is about because that's where I've largely operated in the last 20 years. The second one will be about companies um, because they also control or influence at any rate the way that many of us, most of us behave. And then the third one will be about religions and philosophies. Um, but I'm not letting myself write that one until I'm 70 because I don't think you're allowed to write about religion until you're 70. Um, a good religion idea. index. Ah. Well, I don't know about a good religion index, but certainly a good company index is part yeah. of is part of the second phase, and and that's something that's in uh, in discussion at the moment. It's harder to do than the good country index because there isn't publicly available data or not enough of it. But there are ways around that. And we'll see. We'll see what we can do. So some of your work is about f helping countries to answer the question: What are they for? Mm. What are they going to exist for in this world? Mm -hmm. uh, what is the UN for these days and what is the EU for these days? I mean, these were bodies that in the past forged some kind of cooperation and collaboration. Do they have a clear, do you have a clear view as to what these bodies should be doing? Well, very different answer for, 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 the, for the two. I think the United Nations, um, I'm not alone in thinking that uh, it doesn't do what we need it to do anymore. Um, but it's closer to being able to do the things that we need it to do than any other organization. So if you, the, the United Nations, is, as I'm sure uh, you all know, is, has been celebrating its 75th anniversary this year. And um, as, as part of that celebration, um, they've been doing a lot of research, asking um, more than a million people around the world, uh, what is their view of the UN? And what is their view of the world that we're living in? And what, what role could or should the UN play? And uh, it's interesting because if you look at the summary of those findings, really, really large piece of research, clearly what everybody seems to be saying is um, the world right now really urgently needs some moral leadership for want of a better term. And the view is that the UN is not providing that, but there's no other candidate. And so I think that the, the message for the UN is as clear today as it has been for many, many years now. And that is that it does somehow need to upgrade and update itself, which is an enormous task. Um, I think the UN is enormously valuable, um, particularly the, in the um, economic development, equality, poverty reduction, health side. The General Assembly and the Security Council are different kettle of fish altogether, and perhaps we won't go there now. But in terms of its development and well-being arms, we would be in a very bad place without it. And I think it's an extraordinary institution, but it does need upgrading and it does need remodeling. For a membership organization, that's incredibly hard because, of course, it only has the authority that its members granted, and that authority, authority is necessarily and rightly limited, um, but it does make change enormously difficult. But they know it, and they're working on it, and we'll see what happens. Um, you know, if countries don't find the UN is serving their ends, then they'll go elsewhere. And increasingly, that's what they do, the G20 and so forth. It's a quicker way of getting things done in many ways. The European Union is a different kettle of fish altogether. I, I'm... Um, I, I think the European Union is an extraordinary thing. I've often described it as being the noblest experiment in the history of humanity. And I'm saying in, in conception, not in execution. Uh, it is, as I say in the book, run by human beings. So what do you expect if it's a bit of a muddle? But, and, you know, full of um, inadequacies and inequities and mistakes and chaos. But it's the first time in the history of humanity well, ever since that we invented the nation state, that a large group of nation states have had the wisdom and the maturity 
to cede a tiny, tiny part of their precious sovereignty for the greater good, which is just the logical thing to do economically, socially, politically, and all the rest of it. And they have done it and they've proved it. And this also answers the question, by the way, as best I can, why is it all e European countries at the top of the good countries index? Well, because of the European Union, the countries within the EU have directly experienced the benefit of um, extreme multilateralism, of, of close ties. They've seen what it does for them, and that's why they are able to behave in a more cooperative and collaborative way, why they're more at home in the international community. They know the ins and outs of it. They're better able to benefit from it and contribute to it. And the Nordics even more so because the Nordic countries are an intrinsically historically collaborative subgroup within that collaborative group. The problem with the European Union is that it's suffering from a bit of an identity crisis. I think that's a worse crisis than its legitimacy or, or its efficacy. Um, the fact that it doesn't really know what it's for anymore, which at this point in human history is an extraordinary thing because it's so obvious what it should be for. What it was originally for was ensuring peace in the European continent and it achieved that and it's done itself out of a job. Um, that original purpose needs to be replaced with a new one fit for the times that we live in. It could be all, any number of things. Migration, for example, is a pretty good candidate for the thing that the European Union could try to fix for everybody's benefit. Even though I said earlier on, the European Union isn't big enough to fix migration on its own, but nobody says this has to be uh, just one organization doing it. But, you know, the EU and migration are within each other's destiny. The EU suffers more from migration than many other countries. It is responsible for much more migration than any other countries. It benefits from migration more than any other countries or groups of countries. And it's also got the technology and the incentive and the thinking power to fix migration, the problems associated with migration. I, I must always remember not to talk about migration as if it were a problem. Migration is generally speaking just a phenomenon and it brings good and it brings harm and it's how you manage it that helps, uh, that, that makes the difference. The EU could set itself, for example, the task of making migration into a generally good thing for everybody if it chose to do so, but it doesn't seem to want to acknowledge that it needs a defining purpose, and that, I think, is its biggest problem. We're almost out of time. You've been very generous with your thoughts. Perhaps we could try just a few quick Q&A. Mm -hmm. Craig Heath asks about why, why not educate adults as well, at least to an extent, given that if we want adults to allow their children to be educated differently, we need to get the adults on board. Yeah, Craig, it's absolutely correct. And we, and, and we do, we will. That's part of, an important part of the project, right up to the level of uh, technical education for people in government. Um, I, I failed to mention it simply because the focus is very much on children. But yes, adults are a part of that, as are young adults, as are grandparents, as are teachers. Everybody else needs, needs the education. And there's a question from an anonymous attendee about China. Mm. Uh, does the importance and significance and influence of China in the world uh, stand in tension with what you said, that countries need to be doing good in order to have influence? Mm. Well, China is a very large and very complex country. And like all countries, it does some good and some harm. Um, China is uh, a country which, if you were to do uh, this complex uh, balance, which I haven't yet done in any systematic way, of comparing how well it treats its own citizens and how well, how much good it does to people in other countries, is the likelihood that China would, uh, would be unusual in that respect, that it would seem to be doing more good abroad than it does at home in certain circumstances. This I don't know. By the way, just a footnote there, some, something I've been working on this year um, with uh, the United Nations Development Programme, the office that publishes the uh, Human Development Index. Um, maybe I did mention this briefly. We're talking about possibly superimposing the Good Country Index and the Human Development Index, so you can get a, a more three-dimensional picture of development. Um, that would answer the question. If we were able to get good data on China's Human Development Index and compare that, it's apples and pears, but if we could compare that with the Good Country Index, then we'd have an answer. Is China... Um, that rather unusual case of a country that appears to do more good to the international community than to its own community. This I don't know and I'm not able to measure, but uh, there is no question that China um, does a great deal of good outside its borders and is planning to do more. The One Belt, One Road is likely to be um, a benefit to a great many other economies along the route. Um, trade is generally a good thing, it, um, you know, when it's equitable and uh, all the rest of it. 
brings people together, um, it, it creates connections, it brings it spreads prosperity, it reduces inequality when it's properly managed and all the rest of it. So all of that is good as far as I'm concerned. I have so little information um, about the uh, mistreatment of the Uyghur population. I, read, I know no more about it than any of us do. I read what I read in the newspapers and I have no way of triangulating that information. I take on trust what I read in the Western media, but I don't see too many answers to balance it with. Um, but it does look from the point of view of an ignorant outside observer such as me, that China is a country that does quite a lot of good externally and quite a lot of harm internally and probably also the converse. Harm externally, well, for sure, its behavior in the South China Sea is quite harmful and quite unmultilateralist. But on a broader scale, it appears to talk like and occasionally act like a multilateralist. So who knows? It's complicated. And it may well be that this is the kind of level at which trying to do a simple balance sheet is just no longer possible. You would have to do some far more detailed, far more balanced qualitative assessment of one country at a time. And that is the aim with the good country index, not for it forever to be a simple ranked index made of composite data. At some point alongside it, there need to be uh, individual country analyses, which are more um, uh, which are more analytical based on research and more uh, narrative. This is what this country is doing to escape a little bit from that tyranny of data and the tyranny of comparison. That leads us nicely to what I think will be the last question. It's uh, actually being asked in two different ways. Hmm. Terry Raby asks, uh, in general, there seems to be no talk about purposes for humans as a whole, which obviously would include management of the planet, but might also include understanding ourselves and understanding the universe. Mm. Uh, what is the role of understanding and agreeing a purpose for humans as a whole mm. in your project? Mm. And as it happens, Jared Knowlton has just posted a simple version of that question to chat. What determines what is good and bad? Mm -hmm. um, it's really a fascinating question. And it's one that I acknowledge I don't spend a lot of time on. And the reason for that is because the focus of almost all of my work is um, relatively speaking short term in the sense that what I'm trying to do is to figure out how to make, um, uh, how to make people, um, how to encourage people and countries to behave in a way that is in their long term interest, whatever that interest might be, because for the moment it's a question of survival. Particularly when you're looking at existential challenges like climate change and nuclear proliferation, um, my focus right now is on switching to get, doing whatever I can to encourage people to switch to the behaviors that will ensure their survival. Um, stewardship of the planet and of the natural world is obviously a part of uh, a very long-term um, amendment to human behavior. I don't see that that necessarily qualifies as a purpose. Um, we there get into the realm of politics. What is the purpose of humanity, assuming that we can um, somehow um, produce um, ourselves another few centuries or millennia? Um, it's a different discussion. And um, it's one I'm, I'm always happy to have, but I'm no kind of philosopher. Um, at this point, it, it's, it's just immediate necessity, really. And the other question, well, it is a bit different, isn't it? I mean, it's, that's more of a, um, where does your morality come from? Um, the question of who decides whether, it, whether a behavior is good or not. And of course, that is a cue for a, for a whole other discussion. As far as possible, um, I try to keep it um, on, um, if you like, sort of functional, mechanistic, practical terms. And I know that to a philosopher, that's risible because there's no such thing. But what we try to do in every case when, for example, we're measuring things for the good country index is to take a broadly acknowledged and unarguable uh, challenge like, uh, like, for example, atmospheric CA2, CO2, link that to a behavior which unarguably causes or propagates that issue and then link that to a set of values that says, okay, um, it is generally speaking under most ordinary circumstances, uh, not a good thing to emit a lot of carbon dioxide when there is an alternative. And therefore anything we can do that enables people to emit less carbon dioxide is therefore a good thing. But I should stress, and again, this has the philosophers throwing up their hands in horror because you can't just play with vocabulary and think that's gonna change the underlying concepts. Nonetheless, I do endlessly repeat, I mean good the opposite of selfish, I don't mean good the opposite of bad. 
There is no moral judgment implied here. When a country ends up at the bottom of the good country index, like Libya, for example, that doesn't mean I think Libya is a bad country. That just observes and prevents, uh, presents to people the data for them to do with it whatever they like. The observation, the measurement, that Libya appears to do less good by the readily available measurements that there are outside its own borders than average countries do. Now, if somebody wants to come along and say that's perfectly acceptable and excusable for Libya, as somebody did earlier on, then these are the kinds of conversations we need to be having. I don't claim to be, offer, uh, to be able to offer with this index or even with my whole work completely, a complete account of how the world works. But I do think there are some ways of discussing things that will be more profitable than some of the ways we have at the moment. I'll give you, Simon, a chance in a moment to make any final uh, comments if there's something you wanted to stress. Let me just tell everybody that uh, one of the topics that has briefly been touched on, the use of AI to improve our decision making, our uh, analysis, in a sense that's the subject of next Saturday's London Futurist Events, where George Zakardakis will be talking on the subject reinventing democracy in the age of intelligent machines. Mm. George has a number of hats. Uh, for example, he's a senior fellow at the Atlantic Council. And he says he'll be offering what he describes as a guide to the coming fourth industrial revolution and the post pandemic world, namely a plan for using technology to make liberal democracies more inclusive and the digital economy more equitable. So if that's of interest, uh, people can find the links on the London Future site, which will take you to Zoom. Uh, Simon, you have uh, had all kinds of uh, fascinating uh, subjects raised. Uh, you've raised all kinds of fascinating uh, issues. Is there any final uh, call to action or suggestion for possible next steps you'd like to share? Well, thank, thank you, David. By the way, that next one sounds really interesting. I, I might come to that if I, if I may. Um, Please do, yes, yeah, there's no charge. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, the word altruism popped up uh, in the chat uh, near the end. And um, I suppose the, it reminds me of what is the core message of the book that I don't think I would have allowed myself the luxury of, of adding yet another book, yet another nonfiction work to the, to the pile that must reach Mars and back again unless I felt that I had something actually quite concrete to offer. Not yet another book saying, wouldn't it be wonderful if everybody was wonderful? Um, but a book that actually proposes, to some extent, an alternative to the altruistic approach. Because nation states are not moral entities, um, and neither are, for the most part, the people who lead them. They're not bad people, but they're not driven by morality. They're driven by, um, by um, all kinds of other things. What the, what the argument in the good country equation, equation proposes is the beginning of a line of argument that says, actually, here are some self-interest uh, reasons for countries to start doing the right thing and for people to start doing the right thing. It's no longer necessary, I think, and never really was very effective to go along for people like me to go along to governments and say, look, you should do this because it's the right thing to do or because we in the West do it. Now it's possible to start showing people why it's in their interest to do that. And that's why I think this could be the beginning of some kind of a turning point. At least I hope so. But, you know, read it for yourselves and judge, see what you think and let me know. Well, I do echo that uh, invitation. People should take the time to engage with some of the longer uh, descriptions that Simon offers in his book, and indeed some of his talks, which you'll find on that uh, site, uh, the Good Country Index. Uh, Simon Anholt, thank you very much for being a super uh, guest. Uh, all kinds of people are giving positive comments in the chat, so thank you.